Hello and welcome to Dispatches from India, a show by People's Dispatch where we bring you major stories from across the country, what Indians are talking about and the impact it will have on politics and society. Our first story is from the state of Haryana, where thousands of Anganwadi workers staged a massive protest demanding increments to their salary. Anganwadis are childcare centres and play a vital role in ensuring nutrition, welfare for children and are also often the first step in the education system. Despite the significance of this institution, the workers and helpers are paid a pittance. They receive only rupees 12,000 which is around 165 US dollars and rupees 6000 which is around 80 US dollars respectively in the state of Haryana the workers and helpers had been promised an increment of 1500 and 750 rupees which is around 20 dollars and 10 dollars in 2018 however they have not received this yet this has led to a number of protests and in december they went on strike on january 8 Workers' unions and the government held discussions. While the government conceded some of the other demands, the increment has not been granted. The determined workers have said that they will court arrest on January 12 in protest. We now discuss an issue that's constantly on the minds of many Indians, especially the young. We are talking about unemployment. Recent data shows that the number of households with both members working has declined over the past five years. At the same time, the number of households with no working members has increased. Unemployment data often fails to capture many of the nuances of the situation in India. The pandemic has of course played a huge role on this, but the numbers are part of a more long-term trend. We bring you some of these numbers. Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, Yani CMIE, ne hal mein hi kuch aankde ikhatta kiye जिनसे पता चलता है वे घर जहां दो कमाने वाले लोग हैं ऐसे घरों की संख्या पिछले 5 सालों में कम हुई है जनवरी 2016 में ये 37% प्रतिशत थे जो नवंबर 2021 में घटकर 24% रह गए हैं साथ ही ऐसे परिवारों की संख्या 57% से बढ़कर 68% हो गई है जिनमें सिर्फ एक सदस्य काम करता है जबकि ऐसे परिवार जिनमें एक भी सदस्य के पास रोजगार नहीं है उनकी संख्या पिछले 5 सालों में 6% से बढ़कर 8% हो गई है हर परिवार में रोजगार प्राप्त सदस्यों की संख्या कम होने से समझ आता है कि क्यों भारत में श्रम भागीदारी का दर या WPR में गिरावट दिख रही है नवंबर 2021 में भारत का WPR 40.2% था जो जनवरी 2016 में 44.9% के मुकाबले कम था मौजूदा दौर में भारत उन देशों में से एक है जहां WPR सबसे कम ग्रामीण इलाके में काम करने योग्य आबादी का ज्यादातर हिस्सा खेती से जुड़े रोजगार पर निर्भर हो गया है और जिससे इस क्षेत्र पर बोझ हद से ज्यादा बढ़ गया है क्योंकि खेती से होने वाली आय इसके मुकाबले में नहीं बढ़ रही इसका मतलब है कि पहले जितनी आय ही अब ज्यादा लोगों में बढ़ रही है शहरी औद्योगिक और सेवा क्षेत्र में रोजगार की कमी ने कई लोगों के लिए पलायन का रास्ता बंद कर दिया है इसलिए मार्च 2020 में लगे पहले लॉकडाउन के दौरान जो लोग पैदल चलकर अपने गांव जाने पर मजबूर हुए थे उनका एक बड़ा हिस्सा वापस शहर नहीं आया है ऐसे परिवार जिनमें किसी के पास रोजगार नहीं है उनकी संख्या देश में 6.3% से बढ़कर 8% हो चुकी है अप्रैल 2020 यानी सख्त लॉकडाउन के पहले महीने में तो यह आंकड़ा 33% हो गया था जाहिर है ये वो परिवार हैं जो बेहद कमजोर हैं और जिन्हें तुरंत सरकारी मदद की जरूरत है हालांकि महामारी में उपजे आर्थिक संकट से निपटने के लिए अतिरिक्त मुफ्त राशन बांटने से इन परिवारों की मदद हुई होगी लेकिन यह काफी नहीं है 
इसके अलावा भी बहुत से खर्चे होते हैं जैसे बच्चों की पढ़ाई स्वास्थ्य कपड़े ईंधन आदि For our next story, we go to the south of the country to Pondicherry University. Students who have taken part in a fees must fall movement in 2020 are reportedly facing action. Students movements across the country have faced immense pressure from administrators over the past few years but have nonetheless continued struggles against the increasing cost of education and other policies that will increase the privatization of the sector. We bring you this report on the students who are facing action. We were told uh, to recall the strike. So unfortunately we had to recall the strike and after right after 5 days of that the uh, this pandemic started and uh, the educational institutions throughout the country started uh, closing down. In 2018 the Pondicherry University made exorbitant hikes to tuition fee across the courses and the student community opposed this move. Several rounds of memorandum submissions, agitations, hunger strikes and other forms of protest were held by the students demanding the administration to recall the fee hike the administration was not ready to budge from their stand so during this time also we decided that we will be filing a petition against the university uh, for uh, this fee hike which has happened so we did that and the case is still pending in the madras high court but what why uh, i am telling why i am sharing this thing with you is that when the case is still pending in the madras high court no verdict no direction from the court as of yet that who was wrong who was right or uh, nothing of that sort has happened despite that the university sends one this uh, show cause notice to 11 students who were part of the strike uh, this fee must fall uh, protest and uh, this uh, show cause notice was give, uh, was uh, given to the students after one and a half years uh, of this protest on this 17th december the same 11 students uh, who were uh, given the show cause notice they were uh, uh, sent uh, they were sent a notice uh, uh, as well as uh, a letter by post that uh, they have been debarred from the university for the 5 years and a fine of 10000 rupees uh, have uh, has been imposed uh, on them and they wouldn't be getting their deg- degree certificates or Uh, any other tuition money etc uh, unless they pay this fine the struggle against privatization and commercialization of education is an ongoing one and democratically elected student unions and the student movement has been a barrier for those in power to smoothly impose their neoliberal policies parichay yadav says that is why institutions are imposing restrictions on students to ensure that they do not mobilize against the authorities and their policy during the pandemic we have seen that how it helped uh, in uh, imposing these kind of restrictions or how it ha- it uh, it has helped uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, rapid way uh, for the bjp government to impose uh, their project of commercialization and also uh, restricting the movement in the campuses big public universities the union is the only barrier right now which is stopping their neoliberal policies uh, which they are trying to bring in the campus while in absence of the union in other uh, these uh, central uh, other central smaller central universities there is uh, there is an absence of union and uh, it's easier for uh, the administration to bring in such sort of policies and uh, this is why we believe that if uh, we have to resist that we need to build a larger solidarity which represent uh, the students community across uh, the country and finally as a fresh wave of covid-19 sweeps the world india is in no way immune with cases increasing by leaps and bounds over the past week on friday india recorded over 140000 cases with the big metro cities recording a huge chunk of them immunologist dr satyajit rath explains the situation right now countries should not really talk about waves what we should be looking at is local outbreaks and the trajectories of local outbreaks and the outward spreads from local outbreaks as you pointed out in india the local outbreak the local transmission and outbreaks have been in the metropolitan areas mumbai um, delhi now um, bangalore uh, kolkata um, are are 
growing very, very rapidly in terms of case numbers. Um, the second issue is, um, many of us will remember last year, this was quite frequently said by anti-science skeptics of the COVID response that, oh, it's pretty much like influenza, why are we getting so worked up about it? And there were two responses to that. In the first place, the frequency of severe illness was still clearly higher than in, for influenza. And in the second place, the fact that for two years has been brought home to us repeatedly, that if infection numbers explode in one week as the denominator, then even if a relatively small fraction of infected people become severely ill, the denominator number being large means that the numerator, meaning the people who land up in hospitals, who overload the critical health care system, not simply for COVID, but for all other illnesses that are handled by the hospitals, becomes a massive public health problem. And this is what happened last year with the early strains of COVID. What is happening with Omicron is the so-called good part, which everybody is referring to, calling, oh, it's just another mild viral fever, as the chief minister of a populous state in the country has uh, characterized it. Um, is that true? Yes, it seems to be true that the frequency of severe illness by Omicron is a little lower. But on the other hand, if transmissibility of Omicron is as high as it is showing every sign of being, then within a week, for example, case total infection numbers are so high that even a very small percentage of those landing up in hospitals is going to overload hospitals. This is why again and again and again it is brought home to us that COVID-19 is not so much an individual risk where each one of us is in atomized terror for our lives as a collective risk that demands a societal, inclusive, collective, mutually supportive response. We don't seem to have a special focused set of policies to address the problem of the unvaccinated. All of us should remember that the unvaccinated are not simply random individuals distributed in communities. The unvaccinated tend to cluster as communities, as communities of the marginalized, as communities of the underprivileged. In places like the United States, the communities of the irrational conservatives, the irrational conservative radicals, whatever you call them. Um, all of these are communities in which the in which virus populations can grow enormously, both in terms of rapidity, as well as in terms of generating potential virus variants for future selection, and so on and so forth. So focusing on the unvaccinated and completing their second dose vaccination and where necessary first and second dose vaccination is going to take specifically designed policies. Whether you, we have the drive or not, we don't seem to have developed policies, or at least they're not heard of in the public domain. This is one major issue that I think across the world, and particularly in India, we are deficient in. The second issue connects to this um, point about communities remaining unvaccinated. And when communities remain unvaccinated, what we are doing by allowing communities on the one hand to remain unvaccinated and on the other hand, creating hyperimmune communities, these living cheek by jowl with booster doses is allowing a growing virus population with all the potential variants included in it to be repeatedly tested against the hyperimmune population so that future true immune escape variants acquire the likelihood of emerging. In all okay. these terms, however, in all these terms, therefore, inclusive approaches are absolutely essential. And what that means in vaccine terms is that we should not be in a situation where we are thinking about vaccinating under 18s, vaccinating with additional doses, those at high risk, such as healthcare professionals, 
and completing the basic vaccination should not be either or situations. Our vaccine manufacturer, our vaccine supply, our vaccine distribution, and our vaccination implementation systems need to be geared to deliver all of these simultaneously. Um, it's worth asking if we are doing that. That's all for this episode of The Dispatches. We will be back next week with more stories. Thank you for watching. Thank you.